Alright, welcome back everyone to another guide from Terra Invicta. I'm feeling better so I thought I'd do one of these. And it's a topic I've been waiting to do for a long time, which is nation building and national priorities. Because one of the things about Terra Invicta is that even though it is a space game, the first couple of years of the game, in some ways some of the most critical years of the game, because they're really the years that determine how quickly you get into space and can contest the aliens, is how well you manage your nations on Earth. It's also, I would observe, one of the things that separates good players from the AI, because the AI tends to burn their nations to cinders um, and destroy their Earth economy, whereas players have figured out how to build sim, well, nations that look like this. Anyway, so what we're going to do in this episode is a basic introduction to the priorities, how you control priorities, what they all do, what, which ones are good, which ones are bad, which ones are traps. I want to look at what sort of uh, purposes you should use different nations for, a couple of tics, tips and tricks, uh, and then we are going to have a little bit of a primer on mega nation building at the end, although it's not the focus of the episode. But I know lots of people enjoy building the mega nations, and there's a really good reason to build them, especially if you're playing uh, a faction where controlling a certain percentage of the Earth is required. Begin building mega nations is basically the only way forward. So, with all that said, let's jump in and learn a little bit about nation management. So the first thing we probably need to understand is... Uh, the elements of a nation, like what determines if a nation is good or bad, what are all these stats up here. Uh, I'm going to assume a basic level of understanding with the game, so we'll zip through them. Countries democracy level. More democracy, generally speaking, means more science output. Um, it's also bad for some things, like um, uh, the effectiveness of military spending reducing unrest, but you should never use military spending to un uh, reduce unrest. It's a terrible investment. So generally speaking, more democracy, good. Um, provided your nation is relatively rich and prosperous, uh, otherwise you can get unrest problems. Unrest is bad, you always want little unrest, uh, more than one I try to avoid at all costs, and suppressing unrest with your council is great, but getting the rest value down is better. The GDP, this total number, which is your GDP per person multiplied by the number of people, that increases your investment points, and investment points are what you spend on these things down here. The more investment points, the more your nation can do, uh, for in each month, each month you get this number. So India spends 46.5 investment points per month um, across all divided across all of its priorities. It also is the cost. Well, the unmodified version of this is the cost of your control points. So India actually has 54 investment points before um, you account for all of its armies and navies, which cost upkeep. Uh, having armies costs 0.5, I think, per army. Having them away from home costs more, and having a navy attached to them costs even more. So military spending in Terra Invicta, pretty expensive and prohibitive for small nations. Uh, funding, this is the amount of money you get per month, and it's split between the owners of each CP. So India produces 517 money divided between all these points. I control all of them, so India, which is huge only gives me 507 cash a month, which is, um, yeah, which is uh, kind of pathetic, really, when you compare it to other sources in the game. Research output, boost, uh, boost output, the amount of mission control you generate, the military tech level, so how good the armies are, number of nukes, naval value, which goes up as you increase your mil tech and build navies, population and population growth rate. Uh, population growth rate um, is different between different nations. There are hard-coded values. So, for example, the PRC versus India. India has a hard-coded faster great, uh, growth rate. And it's also impacted by things like, I think, increasing economic development uh, to a certain point helps that growth, but I'm not fully across the, um, the multipliers there. Education level. Okay, so more education level decreases the effectiveness of unity, which we'll talk about later, but it increases science output, so it's great. Uh, cohesion, five is good. This is basically how what single-minded your people are. Uh, at 10, it's very easy to keep unrest down, but research sucks. Uh, at zero, everything sucks. There, there is no redeeming, basically no redeeming features at all. I'm skipping over the details, but I'm just trying to give you the general rules. Um, cohesion five is good. Cohesion 5 is generally going to give you low unrest and the maximum possible science output. So cohesion in the middle is a good thing. GDP per capita, more is good because it drives total GDP and thus investment points. And also things like how happy people are and how much science output they produce. 
That's right. Uh, the more GDP per capita above a certain level within a certain range, I think it caps at about 45,000 from memory, somewhere about that, uh, increasing GDP up to that point actually increases science output, which is one of the reasons why rapidly growing large developing nations are fantastic for producing science. And finally, inequality. Uh, inequality is bad. Inequality drives unrest, reduces cohesion. Like, ideal, the, the ideal un, um, inequality score is as low as it'll go basically, but it's not always the highest priority thing to fix. So those are all the things that nations have in terms of their core stats. The other thing I'll add that is not visible immediately here, because up here, is the number of armies that a nation produces, because that's the other thing an, a nation can give you access to armies which you can deploy around the world in order to take over other nations or do things like repel alien invasions. So nations are useful for the money they produce, the science they produce, the boost they produce, the MC they produce, uh, the armies they give you, the nukes, etc. And this is an important point, a macro point before we get into the priorities. Nations are useful for what they give you. Building a utopia of a nation doesn't really give you anything unless you're getting something out of it. And usually if you're building a utopia, it's going to be things like high science output. Um, or maybe you're building a small nation to build mission control. Decide what you want a nation to give you and configure it appropriately. All right, so let's talk about priorities next. Priorities are how you spend a nation's investment points, 46.5 every month, into these priorities in order to make your nation better so it gives you more stuff. Uh, the economy priority, let's just go through them really quickly in order. Economy priority increases GDP per capita, so it works better, all else being equal, in big nations with lots of population as opposed to small ones. Uh, it's also more effective in nations that are below the cutoff point where you get scaling benefits for GDP per capita. So economy is at its best in high population nations with relatively with low or medium development levels is where it's at its best. Welfare, pretty simple. Um, so economy increases inequality, welfare decreases inequality, and welfare decreases inequality by a lot more than economy increases it. It also has positive environmental benefits. The economy has environmental drawbacks. Knowledge increases education level and pushes cohesion closer to five. So if you want to get cohesion close to five, you have two choices. You can use knowledge to push it closer to five, or you can use unity, the next one we'll talk about in a moment, to put it, push it to five. You can also move the rest value of this closer to five by doing things like decreasing inequality. But the bigger, the more mega nation you have, the lower your rest value is going to be to the point where having a positive rest value in a mega nation is a really, really, really difficult thing. Uh, also, knowledge increases democracy. It's the only way I know of to reliably increase the democracy value of a country. If you are determined to democratizing like I'm democratizing the caliphate at this point in 2036, uh, you invest very heavily in knowledge and that pushes up slowly the government value over time. Unity very slightly decreases democracy over time. It doesn't increase education level. It just does two things. It pushes cohesion towards five and does it a heck of a lot faster than knowledge does, which is why I sometimes consider it for America at game start because America at game start is very politically polarized and divided and fixing it is useful. The other thing Unity does is for every CP that you control, um, every time you complete Unity, so every two investment points, it gives you a public opinion boost. Um, and I believe in nations with low democracy, it's even more uh, effective. So in totalitarian countries, a little investment in unity can completely lock um, other factions out from ever winning the public opinion war with you. Like If people are bombarding you, you'll see here, I've got 11% uh, unity spending in India, and that's just because the servants were trying to take over public opinion. I don't want an agent permanently here spamming public opinion. It's actually hard once population gets to a certain point. A little bit of unity solves the problem. Military spending. Military spending just increases your mill tech level. It also, if, you're, um, unrest, if you have an unrest problem, military spending also reduces unrest. The problem is, the problem is, uh, if you have unrest and you're spending on the military and your military spending is reducing your unrest, it's actually not increasing your tech level anywhere near as much. So it's super inefficient to use mil tech to bring down unrest. Use an agent to bring down unrest, use mil tech to increase the tech of your military. Um, at the originally, when I first played in the old version of the beta, I was like, yeah, every nation should develop into military. I'm now convinced that you should have one nation. If you if you have any nations with Miltech, you should pick one. The United States is the clear best option 
and use one nation and increase Miltech and every other big nation should disband their militaries and they should just rely on one. Because everyone's spending on Miltech, you're basically duplicating yourself. I, I see no reason to invest in Miltech in more than one nation most of the time. Spoils and funding. We're going to talk about them together because these are the two ones that get you money. Uh, boost increases the boost income of a nation. So for every two investment points you put in, the monthly production of boost increases. At the start of the game, this is not very efficient. You get lots of technologies that rapidly increase the percentage here um, from adva advanced chemical rocketry. And there's a bunch of techs out there that give you really high multipliers. And I probably spend 0% on boost in most games I play. Like most, most games, I do not invest a single point in boost. Some people swear by it. And there are a lot of strats that you that will rely on you spending on boost. But if you're doing a like a Kazakhstan United States opening, that's going to be all the boost you need to get into space. And once you get into space and get space mining going, you don't really need boost that much. The only thing you really need boost for at that point is events, and you can convert boost into cash. But there are other, there are other more effective ways to get cash than producing a, a lot of boost and then using it to maintain space hotels. Mission control, mission control, uh, 25 points invested, gives you one ground-based mission control. A little station appears on the map somewhere that generates a mission control point. Hooray. Uh, so this little center here, this would have cost 100 investment points, uh, and it gives you the ability to maintain, well, four points is uh, two level two ships, or four of the smaller ships in the game, or most of a, most of a level uh, three core, core module. So this is this is reasonably good amount of MC in that province. There is a limit in how much you can fit in a province. The number is six for an ordinary province, or eight if the province has a core economic region. So somewhere like uh, European Union's eaten it, um, but tiny European states with core economic regions can fit eight MC. Um, this giant re region of the Caliphate here, this can fit six because there's no core economic region. Uh, finally, build army. Simple enough, 60 points builds an army in a province. Um, if you have an army that doesn't have a navy attached, 100 points attaches a navy to it. As far as I'm concerned, in most cases, armies without navies are pretty worthless. Walking slowly one province at a time, not being able to deploy anywhere in the world. Generally speaking, I think an army with a navy is worth three or four armies without... No, it's, uh, it's worth at least four armies without navies in most cases. Um, if you're doing like expansion in Africa and you're just invading neighboring African countries probably don't need a navy but most of the time you're using things like the US where all armies start with navies navies are just very expensive I believe they cost one investment point per navy per month to upkeep so you can make America much richer if you got rid of the entire military but the military is one of the attractions for using the US nuclear weapons 25 points builds a new nuclear barrage pretty simple I don't think I've ever done this in the game except for um, I think occasionally if you have like North Korea and you want to nuke someone, but you've already used the first nuke in an emergency, you might direct invest the final nuke and then space defenses build space defenses. Um, I used to love space defenses. I'm now convinced that in the current version of the game, they're not worth the investment. Um, space defenses protect one province. So they cost 50 IP and they protect one province from nuclear attack and from an orbit orbital bombardment and from assault carrier landings. But it's better to just build a space fleet, rule orbit and prevent those threats from happening. And as for nukes, well, most of the time you're getting nuked, it's because you're invading someone. Um, or you don't have any nukes of your own, in which case you're monumentally stuffed up. You should usually have a nuclear nation that can serve as your like deterrent. The AI does not like initiating nuclear wars with other nuclear powers unless it is being invaded. So those are all the priorities. When do I want to use them and how do I want to use them? And it depends on what you want to produce. Um, and here I would split nations into, generally speaking, maybe three primary categories and a secondary category. The mo most nations, small nations, their objective is to produce you fixed price products. Namely, they're there to produce you mission control. So for example, a nation here, uh, let's look at Europe because it hasn't been amalgamated entirely. Bulgaria, Bulgaria still exists. Bulgaria costs 10 in, um, control point cap in order to hold and it has five IP per month. It would be more if they brought this unrest down, which means it can produce a couple of mission control points per year. Uh, it'll produce two and a fraction mission control points every year for a relatively low cost, and then it can um, supply those six MC points forever. 
this is quite an efficient way in terms of cost ratio to output to produce mission control. If I compare and contrast with India, India can produce like almost two mission control per month, but the cost differential actually makes it much less efficient at producing it because each of these CPs costs five, cost the same as five Bulgarias. Yep. So this is five, 10, 15, 20, 20. This is 30 Bulgarias and it's not 30 times more productive. <laughs> um, it's So as you can see, small nations are fantastic for producing things like mission control, things that have a fixed payoff. Um, to an extent, they're okay at producing things like boost. Um, and if you needed to produce nuclear weapons in large numbers for some reason, if, if that someday becomes a thing, small nations would be where you produce your nukes as well. Big nations do either a military industrial complex, or they produce crap tons of research generally. Those, those are the two general outcomes that you want out of a nation. So in a big nation, you want to take advantage of scaling things in order to produce usually lots of scientific output, especially with the new patches that are completely, well, they're significantly nerfing mid-game space science generation, which is an annoying but also very required change because it used to be as soon as you got to Mercury, um, a few thousand MIT grads orbiting Mercury would produce the same scientific output as the European Union and the entire North American continent combined. So we're going to build, generally speaking, you would build countries separately um, for these two sort of archetypes, knowledge production and mission control production. And then there's a third version, which is the nation which is designed to produce you money. So how do I build a nation that's going to produce me lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of science? So for a na you I would recommend starting with a nation with very large population. So China is good for this, India is good for this. And the um, what you really need in order to do, do this is fix a number of things about a country. You want to push cohesion towards the middle. You want to get education up. You want to improve democracy. You want to bring unrest down. And you want GDP per capita to get as close to about 40,000, 45,000 as you can. Um, so in these nations, massive economic spending Knowledge spending and welfare spending are generally the way to go with a little bit of unity spending to hold public opinion because the more public opinion you have, the higher your base cohesion is. And also you get lots and lots of influence from having lots of people believe in you. And a big nation has lots of people in it. So a little bit of unity doesn't go astray. Generally speaking, uh, generally speaking, if you're constrained by control point cap, because increasing the size of an economy increases the cost of keeping a country, I would usually go primarily with knowledge first in a nation that is designed to produce a whole bunch of uh, knowledge. The other bonus here is it'll push cohesion towards five and then introduce economy and welfare spending over time. There is a slight bonus for distributing your funds across different fields. But generally speaking, I put huge sums into single foci. Uh, I focus on knowledge. Like I might, I might do something like this, for example. Um, in fact, something like that. 25% economics, 8% welfare, 67% knowledge straight out. Uh, if my goal was to push knowledge at the start of the game and bring cohesion up, uh, unity might be useful at the very start to try and bring this under control. At some point later on, you're going to want to push uh, GDP per capita up, which is where the economy spending comes in, and you're going to want to bring uh, inequality down, which is where welfare spending comes in. Um, I wouldn't let inequality get above moderate, but if you're really focused on building something out, that's sort of okay. And that's how you build a knowledge country, basically. You bring the unrest down, you use knowledge to push cohesion towards five, you get education up, you get democracy up. Um, as democracy value starts to increase, if you haven't built the economy, unrest might become unbearable. You might need to stop and do some economy investment for a while so people aren't so pissed. Same with bringing a little bit of unrest down. Um, all good. Getting multipliers for this is probably the other key aspect to making it work, other than picking a high population nation and eventually building a mega nation. Uh, you get bonuses to economic e efficiency of these bonuses through a couple of sources. So you can see here, I've got a 121% bonus to investments in the economy, which is every, um, I am more than twice as efficient as normal in terms of transforming investment points into economic benefits. So 
I'm growing more than far, twice as fast now as I would if I was doing the same thing at the start of the game. These come from technologies, which is the weakest source of these bonuses. Um, counselors and orgs, which are a pretty good source, and low Earth orbit stations, which are not as good as counselors and orgs, but much more reliable. So if I go to if I go to one of my Earth orbit stations, for example, let's go to the Academy. Earth Space Orbit. See here there's a station up here and you can see uh, if I click on the Information Science Institute you can see here grants a plus 10% bonus to our investments in the knowledge priority if the module is in an Earth interface orbit up to 30%. So if I have three of these level three Information Science Institutes back on Earth in my countries my knowledge bonus which is 78% almost uh, well a significant fraction of that, 30% of that is coming from stations in low Earth orbit, which is the only reason to build um, those stations early on. I'd still generally prefer to go to mines first, but the higher you can drive your multiplier, the better. Most of them, in fact, come from orcs. That's how you build a knowledge nation. Mission control nations are usually small nations, and they just invest in, well, usually, ideally, you want ones with the start with a spaceflight program. So countries like Israel are very, very good. Singapore uh, is very, very good. Small, rich nations that start with a lot of investment points um, and a spaceflight program are ideal for this. You want to stack them full of mission control. And then, ideally, later on, and this is why Europe, one of the reasons the European Union is so good. Once they've filled themselves with MC, if you then absorb them into a larger country, they keep their full benefit, they get absorbed, and life is good. So you use the efficiency of them being a small nation to build the MC, and then you merge them into a large nation, so they cost less in order to maintain relative to keeping them separate. Hope you're with me so far. So small nations exist to build control centers. Uh, if you have a... If you have a... If Camer Cameroon's destiny... Cameroon's destiny may well be to build six mission control centers and then get annexed into the African Union or the Caliphate. That would be a great uh, use of Cameroon, considering it only costs nine control point cap in order to control it. And eventually, with even with its relatively low output, you could hold on to it, build a spaceflight program. If other people take you off it, take it back, and then eventually just merge it in. That's how I would use small nations most of the time. The other use of nations is to produce cash. There's two ways to produce cash using countries. The first is funding, and the second is spoils. Funding is clean, green, nice guy money. Um, every time you put a control point, an investment point into funding, the number of dollars you get per month spread across all CPs goes up. So this, in this case, India, which is a, a mega nation, right? Every uh, investment point in funding would increase the annual income, not monthly, this is a monthly figure, the annual income by 14 per year. And that 14 would then be divided by 12 and get added to this figure for every month. Okay, so if you think about the cost of India and the effect of this, India can increase its total annual income. Let's roughly call it 50 investment points in India at the moment. So it's 140 by 5 is 500 plus 700 income per year per month. I know that's a lot of figures bouncing around. But if you think about that, we could maybe push this number up by like 80 per month per month. Once we equalize everything out. I might have butchered my numbers there, but suffice to say this without me complicating it. It's a slow way to increase your revenues because we'll talk about other funding options in a moment. Spoils doesn't give you anything in the long run. Spoils is theft. It is corruption. Um, it's working with the elites and shady deals. It's, it's ignoring environmental costs. It's corruption. It's bad, but it's so profitable. Uh, spoils... Um, is particularly profitable usually um, in... Da, da, da. I'm not sure if it says it. Yeah. Corruption yields very well in countries with resource nodes um, and not much democracy. So oil-rich totalitarian countries are the traditional targets for spoils. Spoils goes red if you don't put a certain percentage in it. Dictated by which basically says the elites of a country aren't getting their just desserts. People like people like their mansions and yachts, 
And the less democratic and the more corrupt a nation is, the more spoils, the more yachts and mansions that they want. And if you don't give them that, it's easier for someone else to coup the nation. So spoils generates not permanent income, but every time it completes, it generates a shit ton of uh, greenhouse gases, increases inequality, but spits out a heck of a lot of money to the owners of each control point. So one investment point, and Syria produces six per six per month, will give 73.4 cash to each CP owner. So if you own both of these, you're getting 150 cash per control point. And if you're putting all six in, well, let's just say you're only putting, let's just say you're only putting five in, okay? That's already, it'll take years, years for funding to catch up because funding in Syria increases your total annual income by six across all control points. As we all know, money now is better than money in the future because you can use it now and don't have to wait till later. So those are the two primary sources of money. So what is the best way to get cash out of your countries? It's a trick question. Build mission control. Build mission control. And here's why, and here's why I make this, make this argument. 25 mission control on planet Earth gives you one mission control forever with no upkeep costs. The alternative is building mission control in space because you need mission control to do all your productive things in space, to generate research and research bonuses, build ship. Everything useful you do, basically, um, has a cost in mission control. And the alternative is to build it in space. And in space, an operation center has a monthly support cost of 15.4 and space resources uh, which you have to offset, and it takes up a slot on a station. And a slot on its on a station, you can think about it as having a mission control cost, right? If I build a Tech 2 station around planet Earth, now let's zoom out to the battle fleet so I can click on Earth. Let's build an orbital in low Earth orbit. So this station costs me three mission control just for it to exist. Just for it to exist which means each of these slots costs a fraction of that mission control point, right? In order to have here. Plus increasing the MC that you use makes the aliens mad at you. And on higher difficulties, one of the greatest resources is keeping the amount of MC that you use low. So using MC to make more MC in space is possible. It's just going to get the aliens pissed at you. But let's just focus on the money for a moment. A monthly support cost of 15.4 for the rest of the game to have a mission control point in space. Bulgaria here can build that in five months with an investment of 25 IP. So that's two and a half mission control, well, 2.4 mission control produced at the end of a year. 2.4 mission control saves you about 36 cash per month, which means it saves you about 430 cash per year. Okay, so that was my that was my cost in my 60 invest, investment points. What do 60 investment points get me in funding? Well, 10 gets me 60 per annum. Uh, so five, 300. 360, 420 annual funding by the end of a year in a small nation. So once you do the math, the mission control is actually cheaper in terms of its total savings than in plowing your money into funding. Plus you can get decent bonuses on mission control investment much easier than you can get bonuses to funding uh, because there's both technologies and also there's an LEO modifier which accounts for about half of this. So I'm saving more money by producing mission control on Earth than I am generating money by producing funding. Plus, I'm not using space-based mission control to generate mission control, which is a good thing. Plus, if the mission control is unused, you get funds from unused mission control because you're assumed to lease it out to other factions, so it produces even more cash. And unused mission control produces science. So basically, in most, if you're looking at the nations that are built to invest in MC, MC is the better play is the better way to make money than funding. 
because you're offsetting offsetting costs that would be incurred from building operation centers in orbit and you have none of the downsides. Plus the aliens are much less likely to destroy your ground-based MC than they are to destroy your stations and your station-based MC. There might be niche cases where funding, but you can make funding work by piling a crap ton of bonuses on top of it. But generally speaking, space-based funding or mission control is the place to be in terms of money generation, not funding, which is why I don't use it much. On larger nations, um, also, it, it's it's just fabulously bad because it doesn't scale anywhere near enough to justify the CP cost, whereas things like research output absolutely do. India is producing 9,500 science per month at this point in the game. Um, which I'm pretty sure is far more than the entire planet is producing at the start of a standard game of Terra Invicta. That's a very high number. Um, so there's that. Spoils, spoils is an interesting one. So two, two key rules for spoils. Uh, the first is don't generally spoil nations that you want to keep long term because it does them a lot of damage. Um, the second rule is spoil early, not late. I do like, if I'm not playing a rule a game with house rules, a little bit of spoiling in the early years of the game will generate you a lot of money when you have basically no other sources of money. This will let you buy organizations for your counselors because they cost they can cost a lot of cash. The faster you get organizations, the faster you get bonuses. So for example, if I spoiled 555 cash so I could buy Mensa products here, that would essentially generate me 78 funding per month for the rest of the game. Do you know how many investment points <laughs> I would have to invest in funding to get that? Now, yes, I'm using up admin points on my counselors, but usually these also come with a bonus. In that case, it's economy in, uh, economy investment bonuses. So at the start of the game, buying organizations, spoils is a thing. Heck, if you really think about it, knowledge investment and economy investment can, in some cases, be the best way to get funding because, as you can see here, India, through its investment, is now producing 9,500 science per month. Producing that amount of science in orbit would cost an awful lot. Let's just get a quick idea. Looking at the what will soon to be the most efficient option with the changes to MC, uh, I'm not sure I even have it unlocked in this save. I do not. This is the old version, not the patched version, but in the old version, a research campus to produce 100 science per month cost a slot on a station, and this will soon cost a mission control point, effectively increasing its cost to two slots and 45 cash per month for 100 science, which means India is producing 95 times that which means India's science output is worth something like 4,200 cash per month. Not bad. Um, and increasing this is a lot faster than increasing its funding output. So the key point here is I'm trying to make you think about opportunity costs. If producing it on Earth is cheaper than producing it in space, then it's better to produce the thing on Earth than build more stuff in space that costs cash upkeep. And in the case of science and mission control, it's a no-brainer. Produce your science and mission control on Earth if you want to be super efficient. Space just lets you scale those things a lot quicker. And you make no mistake, space is the place to scale research really quickly, and you should still do it. But Earth-based research is still cheaper. What I would normally do, if you're asking just for a shortcut method, is small nations, before I absorb them into big nations, I build the maximum amount of mission control, and then once they're finished building the maximum amount of mission control, if I still am not in a position to absorb them, I'm just going to put them 100% funding until the end of the day. The reason India has such large funding output in this game is not because India invested in it, it's because I owned Kazakhstan as a separate country for a very long time. Sorry, the reason the Caliphate has such huge money output despite being a poorer country than India uh, is because I controlled Kazakhstan for a very long time. It built its full allotment of mission control and I just had it on 100% funding until I absorbed it into uh, the Caliphate much later on. So those nation, national priorities, there are the general rules, what you use them for. Take small nations and use either spoil them or use them to build mission control and then funding. Uh, and in big nations, it's knowledge for education, democracy, polarization, and then send the economy to absolute to, to uh, the economy to the moon and bring um, uh, bring inequality down with a very, very, very 
very rough goal being if you're not CP constrained, economy early to get the maximum number of IP and then switch to knowledge. Um, and then if you are CP constrained, it's knowledge until you can afford it and then it's economy. And then I would stop at about the 40,000 GDP per capita mark. But really, if you're going to be increasing your bonuses, consider like structuring your investments uh, accordingly. Nuclear weapons are a bad investment. Space defenses are a bad investment. Boost is, I would generally argue, a bad investment. The military tech is a good investment for one large country. Um, and I think that's about it. Spoils is a bad idea for countries that you're going to keep long term. And economy, welfare, knowledge, unity, these all have their purposes. All right, so that's how you build an effective nation. The way to do this without having to worry a lot, you can always design a priority template, like not terrible. Um, I've saved one called do no harm, but you can set a priority set here, like 30, 30, 30. You can save that, and then you can set uh, as a default if you want, and then by default, when you take over a nation, that will be applied, and you can set it to all your countries, and then modify accordingly. Um, I usually do that because most of the def default priorities in the game, most of these, as you can see, like, oh, I'm a new player. I'm going to pick industrialization because I want my nation to get better. This puts 22% in the economy and 33% in spoils for some reason because apparently industrialization is defined by corruption. Um, maybe. Um, like expansionist, 21% spoil. Conservative, 22% spoil. What's libertarian do? Libertarian is 43% spoil. Like most, see these, see these natural objectives? Kleptocratic, 100%, great totalitarian 30%. Most of these default patterns and this is a this is a big new trap. Most of these default default traps they're complete dog shit. They're complete crap. Do not use the default objectives. Um, the only time I would use spoils in a country I'm trying to hold on to is if you're desperately trying to fend off a coup while you merge the countries, you can turn spoils up to lower the coup lower the coup chance. That's that's about all I can think of. Otherwise, I would avoid it pretty heavily. All right, next and final point, because I didn't want this to go too long. Uh, general rules on how you do federations and mega nations, because they're very confusing, but also very important. Um, there's two ways to unify countries, okay? Which, And by unifying a country, I mean making two countries into one country by fair means or foul. Um, the simplest method is the military method, which is if you invade a nation with another nation, and that nation has claims on territory... It'll take that territory if it wins. If it has a claim on all the territory, it'll just annex the nation. The way you get claims is through all the research technologies that give claims. And I know they're, they're traps because people love them and put too much science into them a lot of the time, but they're very, very useful. If you go down to the bottom of the tech tree through the unification trees, so... Here we are, all these guys that are based on things like, so you go arrival, international relations, unity movements, and unity movements just unlocks huge amounts of technologies that give certain countries claims on other provinces, which lets them expand. So for example, there's one tech, the African Union, which gives Ethiopia uh, a claim on all of Africa. Uh, and so I can start expanding accordingly. So there's the if I have claims on all of Africa as Ethiopia and Ethiopia invades a country in Africa and takes its capital, uh, Ethiopia just eats that country and if it eats enough of them, it becomes named, sometimes it'll be renamed. So Ethiopia becomes just named the African Union after a while. Um, similarly, Russia becomes the Eurasian Union in most games. Um, this India is not something special, but you know it is what it is. So. The advantage of military unification is it's really simple to understand. The two nations rival each other. Usually I do this by controlling both nations. You rival each other, you get rid of all the allies from the one that's going to be invaded, you declare war, and then either using the armies of the nation that's doing the invading, or the armies of its allies, which is usually what I do, like you just ally the country with the United States and then use the US military to beat up African states in order to force them into an African utopia, um, you merge them slowly together. Advantage, it's quick. It doesn't lead to um, the democracy values being averaged. It doesn't lead to the military tech being averaged in the same way or as aggressively as with unification. So if you're using high-tech nations to invade low-tech nations, 
into the miltech. Invasion is usually better than um, peaceful absorption, although they have made that less brutal, I believe, in recent times. The second more complicated mechanism is to unify peacefully. And the way you do this is by allying two nations together, federating them. So federating is possible between any two nations that have a claim on any of the provinces of each other. So for example, the Eurasian Union at maximum tech level can federate with the United States of America. Why? Because the Eurasian Union has a claim on Alaska and Alaska is part of America, so they can join a federation. Um, federations share, to an extent, research, research output, uh, resource output of certain things like boost, uh, and it's basically a, a higher form of alliance. But if you control all the CPs in both nations, it doesn't really matter. It's just like a super alliance. If you are federated with a country and you are off diplomatic cooldown, so there's always, see these options here? It will show you there's cooldowns. You can't do things super rapidly. So if I go to the relations menu of a country I control, and I want to increase and I want to ally with someone. Uh, I need someone I'm a rival with. I don't think I'm a rival with any country. You know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to rival Armenia so that I can show you I may improve relations after the 22nd of February. So at 22 February in a, in a month and a bit, I can go to normal. And then there's going to be a cooldown and then I can go try and go to ally again. So there's a delay between each of these actions. If you are in a federation with someone, and you, one of the nations has a claim on the capital of another, not a province, a capital, then you can peacefully unify. So for example, um, the capital of the African Union is Addis Ababa. The Caliphate, as you can see, uh, if we click on the Caliphate regions, has a claim on Addis Ababa. So if I send a diplomat, I'll just check that it's available here. There we are. Unification is an option with the African Union. So if I send a diplomat to the set national policy in the Caliphate, um, I will get an option to unify in the African Union and the African Union will become a part of the Caliphate. And thus mega nations are born because this doesn't require you to have claims on all the provinces of a country the way military invasions do. It's just enough to have a claim on a capital, and so you end up doing lots of weird things in order to build mega nations. I do believe that devs are always looking for ways to nerf this or change this, but this is the this is as at time of recording um, the way that it gets done. So, for example, uh, I created Mega India in this game through a number of weird maneuvers that included pushing the capital of China, so giving China this province, which India begins with moving the capital of China here by invading China uh, from the island of Taiwan, which creates a Republic of China, because it has the claim on Beijing, but doesn't have a claim over here. So the PRC still has this province, so the capital moves here. Now India has a claim on that province, so now India can absorb the People's Republic of China. But in the meantime, you expand the People's Republic of China using its claims, as the Pan-Asian Cooperative to do things like eat Korea, eat Japan, you make a giant China which doesn't own Beijing, then you absorb it into India and you've got one nation. Meanwhile, you do all sorts of fun and games to absorb the Republic of China into a mega Indonesia. It's confusing, but through networks of claims, you can build some very impressive mega nations. So that's the basics. Um, take over nations, decide what you want to do with them, if you want money, build mission. Generally speaking, take a small nation, build mission control. After you finish building mission control, consider funding. Avoid the bad priorities most of the time. Big nations, make them. I would generally make them giant research hubs, um, and then amalgamate the nations as the game goes on in order to control more and more of the globe and make even more efficient research stations. That's pretty much it. If they can train the AI to do this more efficiently, the AI will be better on on planet Earth. But for the moment, the AI is improving, but not quite there, which is one of the reasons why the player tends to overtake. I hope that's useful. I'm sure there are still questions there, but I'm trying to keep this trim. I hope it's been helpful in some way. Any questions, put them in the description. I'm very happy to do a follow-up. But hopefully that gives you enough pointers on what's good, what's bad, and what to do in different nations in order to go forward. Small nations, mission control, big nation science. And at the start of the game, Kazakhstan and some other nations for boost, 
but once you're in space, boost becomes secondary at best. I hope you've all enjoyed, and I'll see you again soon.